friends, welcome once again to another edition of the Ministry of Horror. I'm your host, Tez, and um, there's none of the usual spiel this time coming up about watching this live. This is currently going out live, because that isn't the case. Uh, this show that you are maybe watching on YouTube or catching up on podcast platforms is the first of the um, pre-recorded editions of the Ministry of Horror. Now, <clears throat> I've been thinking about the, the show, and we've been going for a little while now. Uh, season one would have started in 2022 when we were streaming uh, every week and doing game streams and, you know, pumping out the content, 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 content. Uh, but by the end of the year, I was just sort of, uh, as we've discussed on the show previously, feeling a bit burnt out. Took a little break recalibrated returned with the show last year uh, i think in february but with a new format of uh, going every other week still live show still going out every other week going on from that point now that is still going to continue so don't panic just yet um, no need to panic but uh, i've been kind of thinking about you know there's there's always going to be moments where hot fresh news drops you know, the week after a show, and it's kind of going to be missed. And if I talk about it at a later point, it's kind of, you know, by the by, people know it already. So why why hear it on the show? And similarly with uh, new film releases. Now, we have been kind of having a bit of a lull period of new exciting horrors for the last couple of months, but there's still going to have always been that period of a new horrors come out. Ideal situation, I've been able to get down to the cinema to watch it at point of release, or I've watched it on Shudder or whatever streaming platform um, as soon as it's come out. But due to the new schedule, I've had to, you know, wait over a week to then discuss it and give my review. And at which point, you know, you may have already seen it, you may have already come up to your opinion, and that's completely fine. But uh, I guess uh, a point of doing uh, quite a review heavy show is to try and be uh, a bit more um have my finger on the pulse of the horror community and get out a bit more content in a more timely manner so uh that being said we're gonna start doing a show every week hurrah i hear you uh, horror fiends uh, yell um we're still gonna have the live show every other week on twitch.tv forward slash tezius t-e-z-z-i-u-s that's not changing. We're still going to be doing the show. We're still going to do watch parties. Um, that show is also, whilst it's going to keep the same format of um, news, reviews, that's also going to continue to be the focus of us doing uh, featured presentations. But with this uh, new show, uh, still called Ministry of Horror, I haven't thought of any sort of witty secondary title or anything yet it's still the show it's the ministry of horror but it's in a non-live format i can record it at my leisure take my time um you know it, it doesn't so much have to be a bit of a rush on a on a friday evening to get stuff together so um and and the show is going to focus as usual on any sort of news at that point um we're going to have reviews but we're also going to feature something that's been discussed on the show a little a little while now and that's retro reviews and it's going to be a slightly more condensed format. I'm still probably going to manage to ramble on as I do. And I think that's probably part of the charm of the show, I hope, um, he says. But we're going to take take that approach going forward, see how it goes. Um, we may end up utilising the podcast specific format. And I think the uh, the videos, because I am also capturing video, will go out on, on YouTube uh, as well. Uh, just because you know we we are now dabbling in the world of tiktok and it's it's good to also have you know a rich vein of uh, content to plunder from for um for that that i was going to say that new app it's it's new to me i'm very behind the uh i'm very behind the trends uh but we are going to put this show out on youtube as well but um yeah no no live stream no live chat on this one but um if that's more of your preference, we're still going to be doing Twitch every other week. So that's the main thing, really. Um, on today's podcast, specific, we are going to have a look at some of the latest in the horror news from around the world. 
uh, specifically bloody, specifically bloody disgusting dot com. Uh, love those guys. Um, and then we've got a few reviews. We have three films that we're going to be discussing, and uh, one of them is a retro review, as as mentioned. But also the main film we're going to be discussing, and it's also going to be a, a bit of a discussion on my trip, and that was seeing the brand new. David Datsmalchian starring film Late Night with the Devil. So that's going to be coming uh, later on the show. Going to give you my thoughts on the film, give a little bit of a rundown, but don't worry, no spoilers as per usual. Um, I will tell you what I think of that. But um, don't worry, this jingle hasn't gone anywhere. It's time for the horror news. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. There you go. You're still getting the jingles. That's what you're listening for. I know. You don't need to be shy. I'll do the same. So, we don't have a list of any new horror films releasing this week. I think uh, at time of recording, might be a bit early for uh, for the uh, bloody disgusting sites update of latest film releases the the main one that i'm aware of outside of today's review uh is uh, immaculate the sydney sweeney starring film drops this week trailers look pretty good for that so that's the main one i know that is on uh is on the schedule outside of uh late night with the devil but first off we're going to talk about uh the world of remakes and we have done a show previously on remakes but here's one that i didn't necessarily have on my bingo card and that is tourist trap tourist trap remake is in the works from producer barbara crampton uh this is a bloody disgusting.com exclusive uh written up by john squires so do check out their website um obviously i i, I love the content and that's what i report on but uh every year hundreds of young people travel the country and disappear 45 years after the release of cult classic Tourist Trap, Bloody Disgusting has exclusively learned this weekend that horror legend Barbara Crampton of Reanimator, Your Next, Jacob's Wife, and Suitable Flesh fame will be producing an upcoming remake of the 1979 horror movie. Alliance Media Partners has acquired the rights to Tourist Trap, and Crampton, the company's vice president of production and development, will be producing the new take on the classic. Crampton is producing with Bob Portal, managing director and head of production at AMP. The original Taurus Trap was directed by David Schmoller. In the film, a group of young friends stranded at a secluded roadside museum are stalked by a master assailant who uses his telekinetic powers to control the attraction's mannequins. Chuck Connors played the villain, Mr. Slauson, the owner of Taurus Trap's Slauson's Lost oasis the ill-fated friends well they all get turned into mannequins making for one wild finale so tourist trap is a bit of a a bit of a cult classic i, I guess would be fair to say it is one where i'd heard about it i think it might have been in um stephen king's on writing his his memoir i'm sure he mentions tourist trap in there it's been a little while since i've read that one i, I usually stick to the fiction because i'm boring uh i i remember it being mentioned in that and i'm sure over the years i've seen uh clips of a particular death scene in that uh, i think it's where a guy i think a guy and a girl have been caught and i think the guy is having um like the kind of the molding paste poured onto his head while he's alive it's quite a grisly moment especially for a film uh from what to say 1979 uh it, it it's one that for a little while i've been on my radar to watch and i think i might have ended up actually just renting it potentially from uh from the prime store because buying copies uh, it had always been quite expensive. And and for me, whilst I am a collector at heart, I do enjoy collecting horror. I end up normally selling it when money gets a bit tight, as as can be the case. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I, more often than not these days, I kind of think, I don't know if I'm going to like the film and spending £16 on a DVD is a little bit steep, you know, like a Blu-ray, sure, DVD, I'm not so sure. So anyway, I saw this on uh, Prime a little while ago. We might have... I don't know whether we streamed this, but I'm sure I must have rented it. Anyway, it is an odd film. It is quite creepy. I definitely will say it's quite creepy. But it is an oddball film. 
Um, one that is definitely worth a watch. Now, how this would translate to today's audiences, there's potential for some real creepy imagery, uh, as as is in the original. I wonder how they would balance the use of the telekinetic powers, because that is such a, it's such a strange subplot of the original film that is initially kind of quite jarring for what at first appears to be quite a straight up slasher, you know, um, and there's nothing wrong with a good straight up slasher. Um, in Barbara Crampton's hands, should be pretty good. I mean, she has been involved in some some classics, cult classics, I think would be more fair to say. Uh, Jacob's wife from a couple of years ago was pretty darn good and suitable flesh. Mixed feelings on that to begin with, not so sure by the end. It's not bad. You know, it's a film of two halves for sure. And Reanimator, of course, is a classic. Um, but they've not all been good. So who knows? Who knows? I'm intrigued, though. Um, I get it's, it's the telekinetic element which I think is going to prove quite divisive if they stick with that. I, I don't know. We shall, we shall see. We shall see. All I can hope is, and this may anger some people, is that it goes down a similar route of uh, um, House of Wax. I think that is such an underrated, more modern uh, slasher remake. It's not modern, really modern now, it's about 15, 10, 15 years old, but I think it's fun. I think it's fine. I never understood the hate on that one. Uh, next up in the news, The Sopranos creator David Chase is directing an untitled horror movie for New Line. Um, so, again, John Squires, but disgusting. Everyone wants a piece of the horror pie right now. So it's no surprise that major studios and big name players are dipping their toes into these red waters. On that note, Deadline reports today that The Sopranos creator David Chase is directing a horror movie. David Chase is reteaming with Sopranos producer Terence Winter on the Untitled Project, which is set up at New Line as part of Chase's first look deal at Warner Bros. Deadline's report ex explains, Chase plans to direct the film in what is Chase and Winter's first theatrical film, screenplay and feature producing collaboration. The project has no title and no synopsis at this time. Stay tuned. So, I mean, The Sopranos is one of those TV milestones that is uh, treated with such, with such reverence. I mean, it's a HBO production, uh, the, t the TV series, and there's normally just that element of high esteem to a lot of their projects. That being said, I have only seen maybe th two, three episodes of The Sopranos. It's kind of one of those shows where I missed it when it was out. It never really hit my radar. I was aware of it, it never really hit my radar at the time. Uh, in subsequent years, I have thought to myself, I do need to give it a go and just, you know, I was quite late to the party with The Wire, and I thoroughly enjoyed that, although I'd never finished it. Thoroughly enjoyed Boardwalk Empire, although <laughs> never finished it. Um, so I imagine I would still also enjoy The Sopranos, but it never never really sunk its hooks into me, which is it's, it's kind of the term that I, I now seem to use all the time. I've obviously watched Hellraiser quite recently, and that's had an effect. Uh, but, okay... I don't really know enough about David Chase and what his uh, filmography is like. I mean, also, The Sopranos is a, is a key part of uh, of his his uh, teleography. But doing a horror film, okay. I mean, always down for new horror films. Now, you, you'd have to imagine that there would be a decent budget um, and some good star power could be attracted to it. So it's one to keep an eye out for, I think, for sure. Next in the horror news, Evil Dead The Game. Developers announced double XP and soul points forever starting now. Again, John Squire's bloody disgusting write-up. Just over one year after the Deadite slaying began, the developers of Evil Dead The Game made the unfortunate announcement this past September that no new content will be created for the game. Additionally, a planned Nintendo Switch version of the game was scrapped. The good news... The servers are still staying up for the foreseeable future. A promise that the team has doubled down on, doubled down on, <laughs> here in early 2024. 
and more good news has arrived today. The team announced great news for our stalwart survivors and dedicated demons. You'll earn double XP and souls, soul points in all game modes starting today until... Until when? Forever. As our thank you to the players, double XP and soul points are now switched on permanently. So hop on there, slay some deadites, and get double the points for all matches forever. Uh, an asymmetrical multiplayer, Evil Dead the game officially launched in May 2022. From Boss Team Games and Sabre Interactive, the game features single player and co-op gameplay billed as the ultimate Evil Dead experience in the world of video games. Several characters from the movies and TV series were playable in the game at launch, along with four different versions of Deadite Slaying hero Ash Williams. So I did pick up the game. I think I streamed it a couple of times. Not, not, that, not that much. But then, you know, I'm not that regular with game streaming uh, as it is. Now, we've talked in the past about my... Uh, not so much feelings on multiplayer gaming. I don't have any any particular feelings toward uh toward it as a concept uh just that i don't have that kind of gaming group that would make these sort of asymmetrical um multiplayer focused games fun and i think part of the the joy of these sorts of games is going to be playing it with uh with friends in a group um, when you get dropped into these multiplayer games with random people, I mean, sometimes you can end up having fun. I've had that you know, a couple of times um, with uh, Dead by Daylight um, and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game, but sometimes it can really just be not a nice experience or just a very silent experience, which really kind of takes away a lot of the point of it. Now, when I did pick up Evil Dead the game, because being an Evil Dead fan, I thought, you know, should give it a go. And I think its its retail price at release was um, pretty competitive. Uh, you know, not, not too expensive at all. I was pleasantly surprised to see that there was a single player mode. But that single player mode was tough as nails. Either that or I'm crap. Uh, I found it very difficult. So I did not get very far in the single player mode. And the single player mode wasn't necessarily such a such a thing as a, as a story. But more like a... Uh, I guess like kind of like a horde mode sort of thing. I mean, you'd have to get to a location. Uh, kill something at that location. Or retrieve things from various locations and move on. Uh, so it wasn't like you were you know, having an opening FMV and the stories unfolding in your actions. As far as I could tell, I mean, maybe I just barely got past the tutorial. That's entirely possible. Um, turning on double XP and soul points, that's, yeah, okay. I, I guess on one hand, that's a nice thing for gamers, but then very quickly that'll be the norm. In terms of for the game so it won't ever seem like it is double xp so it'll just be all oh, this is just the xp and i guess when there's new no new content coming out i guess it would be surprising to see what level of um consumer activity they currently have um clearly it hasn't been as successful as wanted which is a shame due to you know as we can see from the news that the switch version has been scrapped and the servers are not the servers, but no new contents being uh, being made. But yeah, it's a shame. But it's it didn't it didn't click with me. It didn't click with me. Wouldn't surprise me, as unfortunate as it is to say, because it's a a niche property coming up. But um, it wouldn't surprise me if, unfortunately, the um, Killer Clowns from Outer Space game went down the same route. But I, I don't know. I don't know if that's the same developers. Um, and obviously we've also got the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game, which to my knowledge has been fairly successful and is part of Game Pass, which I think probably helps. But uh, yeah, there we go, some gaming news. Next up in the news, The Scurry. Comedy horror movie to pit Olivia Cook and more against an avalanche of deranged squirrels. Uh, Write-up comes from Megan Navarro at bloodydisgusting.com. Animals are running amok in upcoming comedy horror movie The Scurry. Deadline announced today a rather impressive cast set to take on an avalanche of deranged squirrels. Olivia Cook from House of the Dragon, Reese Ifans of Spider-Man No Way Home, Papa Essiedu from Men, Mia McKenna Bruce, Vampire Academy, and Antonia Thomas of The Good Doctor have all joined that cast of the horror feature from director Craig Roberts. 
The scurry will follow two pest controllers who are called to an eco-cafe in a country park to investigate what begins as a routine vermin problem, but as nightfall approaches, an avalanche of deranged squirrels descend, wrecking revenge and mayhem on the staff and visitors in the park. With many fatalities, the survivors take shelter in the cafe as a freak storm takes out the power and communications, leaving them isolated and under attack. An eclectic mix of survivors include pest controllers, a sulky teenager, hypocritical vegans, and a drug dealer. There is only an outside chance of survival. Tim Telling wrote the screenplay. I mean, my initial, um, my initial thought on a film about deranged squirrels is Zombievers. And there's been plenty of other films of that ilk. Zombievers was... From memory, and it's not a great memory, and it's been a long time, Zombie Beavers was pretty fun. I mean, I can't remember anything about the film, so it clearly wasn't that memorable, but it was quite fun. Uh, this, I mean, it's a, it is an impressive cast. I mean, Olivia Cook was uh, one of the many leads in House of the Dragon. Couldn't tell you which character. I watched the whole season. I couldn't remember any of the characters' names. We also had different iterations playing different versions of the characters as they sort of grew up and and whatnot. Um, but she was one of the leads. Um, Rissa Fans is is a classic. I, I'm not sure where the other the other actors mentioned, but um, yeah, the scurry. Okay, fur-clad soldiers to avenge their mistreatment. Yeah, right. Okay, well, there we go. Uh, and then lastly in the horror news. Psychological survival horror title Puppet House is announced for later this year. Teaser is available. This comes from Mike Wilson at Bloody Disgusting. Tropes like haunted houses and possessed dolls are a dime a dozen in horror, but darn it, they're by and large a lot of fun. Developers V Cube Studio and Spirit Game Studio certainly think so, as they've teamed up with publisher Gaming Factory to bring us both in Puppet House. Slated for release later this year on Steam, this psychological horror title sees you roaming the mansion of a deceased ventriloquist, or is he, in search of answers. Uh, yeah, okay, I guess the deceased ventriloquist and then it's got in brackets or is he maybe the or is he should have come after deceased i don't know maybe i i probably just read that weird um in puppet house you'll take on the role of rick evans a photographer whose interest in haunted places has led him to field town and the home of peter hill a famed ventriloquist who has long since departed this life Everyone in the town talked about the place. Many of them even tried to get inside. Articles have been written about disappearances and screams coming from the walls of the abandoned house. And Rick aims to clear the air about these stories. From the initial sounds of things, Puppet House will rely on the atmosphere of the old mansion as you wander around the place. However, you'll soon realise that you're not the only one in the mansion. As you make your way through the place, solving the various puzzles and avoiding whatever it is that you sense, you'll happen upon notes and articles that bring you close to the truth about Peter Hill and his mansion. However, as you might expect, some secrets are best left hidden. Ooh, I mean, when there's a new horror video game, as much as I'm a wuss, it grabs my attention. Especially when it doesn't sound like it's a top-down or first-person multiplayer-focused game. When it sounds like there's a story, and that's the main focus of it, then, um, okay, well, you know, you, you've got a potential customer right here. Uh, there's not too much to go on with that. We don't have a specific release date, but one on Steam to, to keep an eye out for. And I think that's especially interesting because Steam is chocked full of these uh, phasmophobia type games, which, you know, they have their audience. They're incredibly popular. They're just not really for me. So, yeah, if, uh, if, if a haunted house type game is your bag... One that certainly looks quite grimy and dark. I mean, the aesthetic of the picture from the screenshot on uh, on Bloody Disgusting is a little bit of a Spencer Mansion sort of vibe, but in a smaller sort of house, I guess, in terms of, like, the lighting. Uh, you've got lots of uh, browns and kind of golden tones with a lot of darkness and shadows. So, yeah, it's, it's one to keep an eye out for, I think. Definitely. Uh, and that is it. For our horror news.
That was the news. Oh, oh, oh. There you go. Now it's time. God, look at this. We're breezing through it. It's not doing my usual rambling that uh, takes up half the show. We're now ready to talk about some reviews. <laughs> Now, the first up on today's reviews, uh, I've picked a film that is available on Prime, and it's one that has sort of grabbed my attention in terms of being a film that is available to stream on Prime. One that I kind of had thought, do we do this as a watch party at some point? Um, but last night, I uh, when I got home, I kind of... I kind of fancied watching a, a, a quick kind of bite-sized horror film before uh, before going to bed. And I had a quick little look around. A few newer ones available for rental. And I thought, oh, you know, is that going to grab my attention if I'm spending money on it now? Maybe not. So I, I went ahead and uh, watched Terror Trips on Amazon Prime. So if you are a subscriber, at least here in the UK, you can watch this as part of Prime. Uh, it's directed by Jeff Seaman, written by Jeff Seaman, starring Hannah Fearman, Damien Maffei, and Chaney Morrow. Came out in 2021. Um, the, the, the general gist blurb is six friends start a business providing guided tours to the shooting locations of the world's most famous horror films until they find the one spot where the horror is real. Now that gives you a fairly succinct setup for the film. And I think it potentially gives you more detail than is in the actual film. Uh, and that may well sound harsh, but bear with me. This really is quite a threadbare horror. Um, as much as I don't really like to rag on films i understand from a from a small extent the uh, the filmmaking process and you know people are getting out there they're making their films that's the main the main thing you know get out there make your films but it was just it was just threadbare it was just dull um in terms of the setup, the six friends starting a business, you've just got these fairly kind of static shots of this this group sat around talking about they want to make a film. Well, not talking about making a film, but talking about their favourite horror film. So you you know your your horror fandom is uh, is tickled a bit by them talking about these classics of the genre and uh, various different entries. And interspersed into that is this subplot involving uh, the Russians and the black market organ trade. But even just saying that makes it sound slightly more interesting than it actually is. We, we've got just a lot of these long static shots of the people sat around, the characters sat around talking. Um, we've we've then got the the moments of horror are just <laughs> now i believe looking at this that this was shot just as things were opening up after the covid19 pandemic um in the midwest there's a bit of trivia here saying terror trips was the first sag film to shoot in the midwest after the start of the pandemic the script was altered to incorporate more exterior scenes in an attempt to mitigate risk of covid19 infection the plan along with other safety measures worked 257 covid tests were administered to cast and crew and all came back negative yeah okay that makes sense certainly does make sense because a lot of the scenes are just these static shots of the groups walking around in the forest or, or or sat around talking and it's not as even as if it's it's a slow burn and this is building up the group dynamic so when things happen to them you are affected it's that's kind of given it a little bit too much credit and it's not got a terrible cast i mean i believe I can't really open it up now for some reason, but Hannah Fearman, who's one of the stars, yeah, she was in VHS, and then the spin-off of that, um, Siren. I believe she was in Siren. 
it's not coming up now, but um, she's a good actress. And the VHS segment and the Siren spin-off were some of my favourites. So, the Siren's a fine film, but the VHS, that was one of the best segments in, in the first film, and I'm a big fan of that. So Seer in this film, I don't know. It's To be honest, I didn't even recognise it was her in it. And maybe it would have had a bit more of my attention because of her being an, an actress who I've seen in a few features and she's done very, very well. But unfortunately, quite forgettable in this, as with uh, as with all the actors. They, they go between forgettable to actually quite poor. There's a, a kill scene or a revenge kill scene with a scalpel that is just, it's shot so badly. It's... <laughs> this is a tough watch. Could I say this is one of the worst I've watched? Well, maybe not. I mean, I did the whole series of uh, <coughs> Full Moon reviews back in the day. I don't know if this is possibly, though, my one of my worst scores, maybe. I'm going to give Terror Trips a 3 out of 10. Um, I'd be potentially thinking about bumping the score up to a 4 because the artwork is pretty good. But that's it. That that's really all it has uh, has going for it is decent artwork. The film itself is poor, so three out of ten for Terror Trips. Next in the reviews is our retro review, and I, when thinking about doing a retro review, I, I had a quick look on uh, on Shudder. Shudder has a nice mixture of the classics, cult classics, uh, Jallos, things from every every little horror nook and cranny of the genre but one caught my eye because i had seen this uh via friend of the podcast uh peter goddard quite a few years ago and i figured i'd quite like to give that another watch actually because i remember it being a lot of fun uh for the, today's retro review i've gone with uh pieces with the original spanish title being mil gritos tien lo tien la noche uh, which translates to the night has 1000 screams uh, 1982 spanish american slash film directed by juan piquet simon um written and produced by dick randall and starring christopher george linda day george uh frank branner edmund purdom paul l smith ian sarah and jack taylor the plot follows an unknown assailant killing female students at a college campus in boston who uses their body parts to make a human jigsaw puzzle i mean that's a little bit of a spoiler because that's right at the end of the film uh, apologies this is me reading uh the blurb on wikipedia but the film came out in 82 it's not <laughs> i wouldn't worry too much about spoilers on that one um it was distributed in the united states by film ventures international since film's release the film's attracted a cult following and it's been a drive-in favorite while not prosecuted for obscenity the film was seized and confiscated in the uk under section three of the obscene publications act 1959 during the video nasty controversy so yeah the film <laughs> This could very easily be a by the numbers 80s slasher. Um, initially, I was kind of thinking Giallo, but uh, I don't really know if you can apply Giallo to Spanish films. Giallo is pretty systematic of, uh, of its it Italian Italian horrors with the the gloved hands and and, and whatnot. But uh, this is more of a slasher film, and it is not light on the gore either. Um, <clears throat> or the nudity this is it's one of those uh <laughs> it's very much of its era um but quite early on into this film i mean literally in the opening moments when we see 10 year old timmy reston um getting picked on in a very that's a very light way of putting it getting uh picked on by his mother due to him playing with a jigsaw puzzle of a woman of ill clothing it all kicks off, it's all seeming quite a dis, uh, disruptive household, and he ends up murdering his mother and dismembering her with a hacksaw. He kicks, kills her with an axe and then uses a hacksaw. This is a ten-year-old child. So you're straight into the nitty-gritty with this film. It, 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 it's, quite, it's quite intense from the off, 
And it doesn't really let up from that point. When we get to the present day of 1982, straight off the bat, a female is decapitated with a chainsaw by someone unknown who has uh, quite an interesting appearance there, clothed in black with uh, like a large, I don't, I don't want to, I don't know what type, I'm not very au fait with hats, but he has a large wide brimmed hat on. And that is our unidentified killer, our master assailant throughout the film and a lot of the murders in this are just full on there's stabbings there's uh gunshots lots of chainsaws it's uh it 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 there's nothing really there's nothing nothing really left to the imagination in this film um the performances are the performances are fine you know there's no one really that massively stands out i suppose i suppose linda day is really our our central protagonist uh for for the most part along with christopher george their performances are pretty darn good i i will give them that outside of them yeah no there's no one's really poor no one really lets lets the project down it moves across at quite a brisk pace just under 90 minutes the score for this and that's i guess partly why i i sometimes sort of veered into mentioning giallo as a as a genre uh, the score really has that uh atypical sort of um synthy tone which is very much of the era this is early 80s and synth was synth epit epitomized the 80s in terms of uh music and, and scores of, of horror films specifically but it did have a slight feel similar to the goblin scores of a number of dario argento films not quite as good as uh, as the goblin scores but it was pretty good it was a pretty good score really uh this if you if you enjoy a good pretty visceral slasher from the 80s with a bit of bad dubbing um a bit of bad dubbing the dubbing is the dubbing is fine the dubbing is as good as you probably expect from uh from from the time then i would recommend it i certainly would um yeah th i think a couple of the standouts outside of some of the kills would have to actually be the double fake out ending which was really good um I obviously won't go too much into details. I know that this isn't a new film, so you could argue going to full spoilers, but I often feel that a, a kind of a point of doing these retro reviews is if you haven't seen any of these older films. And I feel if you want spoilers, you can always read up the synopsis online or, or find spoilers elsewhere. But for me, I tend to more often than not prefer to watch the film and experience it for the first time in that way um not know what's coming because that's for me takes some of the enjoyment out some people don't mind that at all and that's fine but i had a great time with pieces i think in terms of the pantheon of slasher films it is one which doesn't hold the same esteem in terms of name value as uh, as your, your halloweens your nightmare on elm streets um so on and so forth but it's definitely one worth checking out for sure i'm going to give uh pieces eight out of ten i'm going to give eight pieces out of ten pieces for pieces definitely one to check out um and finally in our reviews we have our almost featured presentation of reviews we're going to be talking about late night with the devil the new film, written, directed, and edited by Australian siblings Cameron and Colin Cairns, executive produced by Joel Anderson, Rami Yassin, and uh, by the star of the film, David Dutzmalchian. 2023 found footage horror film. Um, so I won't go too much. I mean, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the day because, you know, it's, it's something mentioned previously on the show and it, it was a fun experience. But um, myself and my girlfriend got um the opportunity to go to uh, to a london screening on monday the 18th an early screening of late night with the devil 
This is a bit of a first for Ministry of Horror. I'm um, not going to lie, I was very, very excited about the opportunity. Um, so very, very thankful for the company that gave me the opportunity because it was so cool. Uh, getting into the room with a number of other film critics, journalists, um, really, really nice setting. I did have, and I'm not ashamed to say it, a bit of a fanboy moment. Although I, I, I kept my cool in terms of, well, I say kept my cool. <laughs> I'm just trying. I'm just trying to keep some esteem here. Um, I had a bit of a fanboy moment because uh, in walked to this screening, um, Mark Commode, who in in the UK here is a very well known and especially in the horror community, film critic, uh, journalist. So, any early listeners of the show, people who may have listened to the show, maybe from the beginning may remember that um, I discussed one of my earliest horror introductions was seeing Halloween, the uh, John Carpenter film, on, I believe it was BBC Two. It has to have been the first horror film I ever watched. And the introduction video was done by Mark Commode. And that just really set up this mystique about the film. And then seeing it and just being encapsulated by the score, by the performances, by John Carpenter's direction, I I feel what also added to that moment was the introduction. It's something we don't really have much these days, if if at all. But I do feel with particular films, it just adds a bit more investment into it, and a bit more uh, interest that you may not have had initially going into it, especially if you have no knowledge of that film. Um, Mark Mode has also done introductions on uh, Channel 4 to The Exorcist, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, first time seeing those films. Um, although The Exorcist, I believe I rented on VHS with my dad, but uh, seeing it on TV. And um, a few others. There's been a Stephen King season that Channel 4 used to do, and he would introduce the films. But anyway, seeing him walk in, I was very much just like, oh my god, starstruck. Um, it was it was a really cool experience for me. I I um I held back from going to say hello. Uh just for, for two reasons. I, I hear, you know, don't meet your heroes, just in case they let you down. Um, so that could have been one thing. Uh, and also, I, I, I very much wanted to act like I've been here before in terms of, you know, at a, an advanced screening for a film. So um, who knows? If I get the opportunity again and uh, a pass cross, maybe I will grow a pair and say hello and, you know, just mention part of uh, part of my introduction to horror came from him. Who knows? He might be like, oh, well, that's cool to hear. Or he might be like, piss off nerd and don't come back here again well that's that's worst case scenario um either way we got to see late night with the devil and advanced screening in london it was great went out for dim sum around chinatown i had a great day loved it and part of that great day not just spending time with my lovely girlfriend was also watching late night with the devil i'd had a high level of intrigue in this is like a month or so back when the trailer first dropped. David Dutzmalchian is an actor who I've seen in a in a few things here and there. He's played bit part roles in a number of things, and he normally plays quite creepy individuals or quite unnerving individuals. Um, he's been in Dark Knight. He's been in Dune. I, I'm just going to say part one. I can't remember what happens to him in part one. I've not seen part two. Um, he's been in Suicide Squad. Prisoners, which is one of my favourites. Uh, favourite thrillers of the last few years. But he's now playing the role of talk show host Jack Del Roy. Um, we get this brilliant introduction which really sets the tone as if this is a found footage film but uh, the broadcast like in a in in terms of a in like a documentary the broadcast footage uh, of a lost episode that has now become part of infamy talks so talks about the 70s talks about this new talk show night owls with jack delroy Talks about the setting, the satanic panic that um, 
really whipped across America in the seventies, uh, especially across the Bible Belt of America. And also, one of the things that I just found really interesting because it's it's something that has uh, really become more and more uh, prevalent with with conspiracy theories and social media is they have their own version. I can't remember the exact title. I think it might just be called The Grove, which is like a version of Bohemian Grove, which is this reportedly satanic retreat area that is frequented by the Hollywood and political elite every year, like a like a men's club where you know all of these high standing individuals in celebrity and celebrity and, and, and politics and society meet and who knows what they do there there's reports of uh, satanic um, sacrifices and such one of those things where it could just be people whipping something out of nothing or who knows and there's various bits of footage who knows how real it is or if it's you know what whatever involving these like massive statues of owls I don't really know the connection. I probably should look into it between like owls and the paranormal and Satanism and all that. But, you know, I think Twin Peaks, I think owls and the owls are not what they seem, all that stuff. Anyway, we get a lovely introduction with this really intense voiceover with a really deep booming voice talking about the satanic, uh, the satanic panic period and also the history of the show Night Owls with Jack Dalroy. So again, I'm not going to go deep, deep into spoilers here, because I do think, you know, depending on your interest, that you should watch the film, um, which I should mention is available theatrically from the 22nd of March, uh, but, but will be available on Shudder, as far as I'm aware, Shudder everywhere, but at least Shudder in America on 19th of April. So if you are unable to get out to the cinemas, you don't have that long to wait to be able to watch it at home. You just need a Shudder subscription or their free pass for a, a, a month or whatever it is. So we get all this information on, on the show. Leads us then into it. And the format of this, and as the introduction says, is here is that rediscovered master tape of the episode, along with previously lost behind the scenes footage. And I just think that that sets us up so well for what is essentially a talk show. Now, all of the presentation just has this air of authenticity for 1970s television. It's got that kind of, I believe it's a 4-3 aspect ratio, kind of the block box as opposed to widescreen. You've got the um, kind of CRTV TV scanning lines appearing, the distortion, especially when they go to rewind footage. You know, it's not like today with digital rewinding where you can literally go frame by frame and everything is crisp and clear very much of the time where it's you get scan lines you get deviations in in the quality but we're brought into this talk show and uh as as the show goes on it's set on halloween and the main crux is jack delroy is this host the show's struggling they're trying to get things back on track uh there's been um you know he, he's had some words said about him and supposedly his links with this this grove society um but you know he's also been through some some hardships in his life and uh the show has always sort of been second best so this is a real sort of last ditch attempt to to get the show uh, where it needs to be in terms of you know ratings and to do that they are bringing on a number of different guests one of which or two of which i should say is uh laura gordon playing dr june ross michael or june ross mitchell i should say a parapsychologist and author and the subject of her latest book um ingrid torelli as lily a girl who is supposedly uh, possessed by what may be a demon called abraxas but who knows uh, the young girl's the sole survivor of a satanic church's mass suicide. So I think that is pretty much enough real setup in terms of story details to give you an idea of uh, the general gist of what is going to go on here. This is a slow burn horror. And I say slow burn in terms of things take a while to ramp up, but... I don't want that to be misconstrued as slow, slow burn. 
this very much has such a level of charm to it and humor and it does that really difficult job with horror of balancing humor with terror in terms of it's not going down the route of comedy horror but it uses the humor to set up the environment to ease some of the tension where appropriate but never to distract from the horror and never to downplay the horror the horror is what we get much later on into this film um I would probably have to start off by just saying David Dutzmalchen is incredible in this. His role as Jack Dalroy. Uh, th this is the kind of performance that I think if this film gets the sort of release that it should do and gets the um, recognition um, or the advertising or, or, or whatnot um, that it requires, that it deserves, that David Dutzmalchen should start booking these bigger roles more often certainly this this i think is kind of like a bit of an arrival for him uh his performance as jack dalroy it it does that that brilliant thing of treading the line between having that big beaming smile the captivating charismatic talk show host who just wins everyone over everyone just you can't help but smile back at him quick-witted all that good stuff, you know, keeps things on track, doesn't get distracted um, with moments of pain and anguish, with moments of there's something not quite right here, uh, with moments of uh, of outright terror. Um, it's, it's a really brilliant performance by David Dutzmalch and, uh, and Laura Gordon, her role as Dr. June uh, Ross Mitchell. She she does great in terms of bringing the concern which you can't help but also feel that this isn't a good idea and that really things should be stopping now um because she is worried that something isn't quite right in terms with lily i mean obviously she knows lily's possessed by something but in terms of it's not going how it usually does when she has these conversations with the uh, the entity that is inside lily uh, ingrid Turley is incredible as lily um it you if you've seen the trailer you see the moments of possession and we've talked before in terms of possession horror that you normally have this whole thing of there's the typical benchmarks of possessions levitation young child a boy or a girl who talks with the voice that's the the doubled up aspect of a uh, adult male and adult female whatever voice to give it that demonic tone and we do have it here but it just it feels a bit more guttural and there's moments where you get these quick flashes of something inhuman about the appearance and it, it does great in that it doesn't linger on those moments so there's sort of bits where you just think oh i'm gonna have to watch that again uh, because something wasn't quite some, something looked like was the jaw elongated was there something um just disturbing in terms of uh in terms of the presentation um and outside of the there's quite a few other actors in this but i will also have to give uh give mention to ian bliss as carmichael the conjurer a former magician turned skeptic uh it's a that's another brilliant performance because carmichael is essentially the resident skeptic the person that is kind of there to say how these because there's also a psychic on the show how the psychic is a charlatan uh, how the parapsychologist is a uh, is um trying to hoodwink people and talking nonsense and these are all cheap parlor tricks so he is there to essentially um shoot down these things and he does so in quite a quite an at times rude uh but quite a funny funny manner his role in this I, I i really quite enjoyed the character as much as he is a bit of an arse i think he did i think he was played brilliantly um just just the 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 70s aesthetic and tone i just think the authenticity shone through and we've talked before about kind of 80s set things or hp lovecraft set things having that atypical 
uh, neon pink purple glow to to show that it's otherworldly or whatever or overtly heavy synth because it's clearly influenced by the 80s or maybe influenced by stranger things for example but with late night of the devil I guess the 70s, in terms of a setting for horror, is something we don't get quite so much. It certainly hasn't had the the renaissance that the 80s has had, which has probably been spearheaded by Stranger Things. But there was just something really encapsulating about the authentic, authentic approach to showing what is supposedly a lost tape from the 70s of... The, the the night the devil came to a talk show we get some we get some gore in this film but it isn't super gore heavy it's never overtly gratuitous but there are a couple of shots where i found myself going oh fuck um <laughs> just because i wasn't quite expecting them to go there and i think that's again because the first let's say hour of the film has had this talk show focused um feel to it that when things start to get uh supernatural paranormal um drenched in horror it does take you almost by surprise um i won't really go too much into the 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 finale because i don't want to do any spoilers but what i will say is this is a real treat for fans of uh for, for customers of shudder in terms of a lot of the Shudder films, even the good Shudder films, um, you know, have have had their negatives. They've, in terms of seeing a, a new horror film at the cinema, it's got to be one of the most original things that I've seen in recent years. Um, and I'm not saying that because because of how I was able to see it, and I know that, that there could well be potential views of that. Um, I genuinely think that this has just had such a unique approach that i couldn't help but just be along for the ride um i certainly want to see what uh, cameron and colin cairns come up with next i don't know what uh, what sort of things that they have released prior to this um if if they've done maybe short films i'm, I'm not too sure but i definitely want to see what they come out with next and i guess this is really kind of earmarking that uh the 2020s may be the decade for Australian horror to come into the mainstream. Perhaps we obviously had um, Talk to Me, and uh, and now with uh, with Late Night with the Devil, this this could be the start of an Australian horror renaissance. Um, I couldn't really think of a score yesterday. I think this is one of those films where I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I needed to to sit on it and kind of just take a, take a little while to process my thoughts on the film. And I do tend to find that sometimes it takes having a sleep, doing other activities, and and then starting to really think about the aspects of the film that I enjoyed or the aspects of the film I maybe didn't enjoy for me to formulate a score. Um, normally, it, it's rare for me to watch something and think, holy shit, 10 out of 10, straight off the bat. Um, and also I don't really give films 10 out of 10 I, I, I don't think there's a film which is just perfect I don't know maybe Halloween <laughs> the, the first of course um, but in terms of now that I've kind of thought on it I really did enjoy this film like I I mean I, I'd be half tempted in a week or so you know to watch it again in the cinema maybe uh, i certainly want to see immaculate when that comes out um but i would definitely be watching this on shutter for sure when it comes to shutter and even to the extent where i hope that they do have a physical release and i, I say that because sometimes shutter releases or, or films in general these days when they go to streaming it's not always a dead cert that they will then have a physical release later down the line but if this gets a nice blu-ray release then i will definitely be picking it up um I'm going to give Late Night with the Devil a uh, 9 out of 10. Because I just think that there was so much to enjoy about this film. And when I think about a film for review, I also have to think about what I didn't like. And with, you know, one of the earlier reviews, Terror Trips, there was a lot not to like about that film. 
when I think about Late Night with the Devil, you know, it doesn't overstay its welcome. It doesn't drag. Um, it, it, the same extent, doesn't rush through things. It's got imagination. It's got the authenticity. Um, it just ticks a lot of boxes for me. And I can't wait to see where the directors go next with it. I can't wait to see what David Dutzmalchian uh, yeah. and Laura Gordon do next. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not too familiar with Laura Gordon or Ian Bliss from other works of theirs, but uh, definitely David Dutzmalchian. I, I think that this should hopefully start opening some doors. And he is a guy who I know has a real love for horror. I believe he has uh, hosted at, at least the last two um, Golden Chainsaw Awards, the Fangoria is it Golden Chainsaws. But yeah, he's got a deep horror, love for the horror genre, so always interested uh, to to see where he goes with that. So um, 9 out of 10 for Late Night with the Devil. And that is it for this non-live version of the Ministry of Horror. We've run in it just over an hour. Wow, I mean, it's been a very long time since the show has gone that short, but uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Be sure to give us a like, follow on whatever platform you're consuming the content, whether that be uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or even YouTube. Um, and be sure to check out twitch.tv forward slash Tezius, T-E-Z-Z-I-U-S, for the live streams, which go out every other week. Uh, the next show, subject to change, will be Friday 29th. The, the day sometimes change a bit earlier, a bit later, but uh, that will be usually when the show should next be streaming live along with a watch party. We'll also do the occasional bit of gaming over there. And recently we have delved into the world of TikTok. So uh, expect the odd uh, clips from the shows to appear on there. So if you do use TikTok, just search for Ministry of Horror or it's like at ministry.of.horror. I ran out of characters. Just search for it, you'll, you'll find it, um, and catch you later on.